Good afternoon. As chair of committee for King, it is my privilege to welcome our moderator, Mr. Jarvis Dorch, our esteemed panelists, Senator Chad McMahon, Dr. Vernon Rayford, Ms. Jamie Raspberry, and Mr. Shane Spees, as well as those of you viewing online this special program today by the committee for King. I'm Sean Brevard. Due to the inclement weather forecast, we made the decision to forego the in-person session at the Civic Auditorium and revert to a fully virtual format for everyone's health and safety. We thank you for your understanding and your adaptability. Before we get started, I invite you to review the long list of sponsors on the committeeforking.org website to understand the strong support this weekend's four days of programming receives from across our community. These events are simply not possible without our sponsors. Tomorrow's MLK Day program is led by our partner organization, The Modern Beauticians. The program begins at 10.15 a.m. at the former VF Factory Mall on Southeastern Boulevard with scholarship recipients, drill teams, and a balloon release, and that'll be followed by the motorcade at 11 a.m. We also appreciate the Volunteer Hub of Northeast Mississippi for their work on the Socks and Skivvies Drive, which ends tomorrow, making the holiday one of service in honor of Dr. King. I want to frame today's session as an outgrowth of last year's series of panel discussions on systemic racism and its effect on education, health and wellness, banking and finance, and criminal justice. Those segments remain on our website for continued review. Committee for King is dedicated to the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., keeping it alive and relevant to today's society. Last year's thoughtful sessions offered insight into the modern day challenges of the triple evils of poverty, racism, and injustice. Dr. King gave his life to those very challenges. We believe that the opportunity for open, honest dialogue and fair, respectful exchange of ideas can make a positive difference for all of us. We also believe that the health of all of our citizens is critical to the well being of each of us individually. We are all connected. As our state leaders grapple with difficult decisions during the current legislative session, today's panelists will shed light on the topic of Medicaid expansion in Mississippi. We thank you for your attention. And I now turn today's program over to our moderator, Jarvis Dorch. Thank you, Jarvis. Thank you, Sean. Um, and thank you to uh, everybody on the committee for putting this together and especially for the invite to help moderate and um, bring this discussion on. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Jarvis Dorch. I am currently the executive director of ACLU of Mississippi. Uh, prior to that, I was a member of the Mississippi House of Representatives and also a health attorney with the Mississippi Health Advocacy Program. So my role today is just to create dialogue and allow our great panelists to share their thoughts and experiences. But before that, I'll, I'm also charged with setting the, the table for today's discussion on Medicaid expansion. So I'll just give a brief summary um, of where we're at on Medicaid expansion and what we're going to be talking about today. Medicaid is a public health insurance program that is administered by the states and financed jointly by the federal and state governments. In Mississippi, the federal government usually pays around 75% of our Medicaid costs. The state, repay, the state pays the remaining share. Prior to the Affordable Care Act, most states limited their Medicaid programs to covering low-income children, parents, seniors, and pregnant women, as well as disabled persons. Um, Mississippi pretty much followed that, that path as well um, and has a very limited current Medicaid program. The ACA offered a new financial arrangement so, so states would cover adults. Under the act, Congress paid 100% 100, 100 of the cost for healthcare to, for low-income adults. That match would ultimately fall to around 90% where it is right now and currently stands. Uh, in 2012, the US Supreme Court upheld the Affordable Care Act but in doing so, it did limit the, the law's Medicaid expansion provision. The court held that a state could turn down the expansion and not lose its current Medicaid funding. Um, as a result, some states have chosen not to expand Medicaid, but to date, 38 states have opted to expand. Of the 12 non-expansion states, eight are in the South, including Mississippi. So that brings us to today's discussion on Medicaid expansion and to our great panel. Uh, I'm gonna briefly recognize our panel and allow them to, um, to come forward with some opening comments, and then we'll get started on the discussion. Our first panelist is Senator Chad McMahon. Chad was, Senator McMahon was first elected to office in 2014 as an alderman and is currently serving as state senator to District 6, 
which is made which is made up of uh, parts of North Lee and Western Etowah counties. Senator McMahon. Good morning. Thank you for having me today. Happy Martin Luther King weekend to everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the exchange of ideas. Um, as chairman of local and private in the state Senate, I've had an opportunity to travel the every count, visit every county in Mississippi over the past two years. And I've come to the conclusion that you've got to have three things to have a successful community. You got to have access to good schools, you got to have a local bank branch, and you absolutely have got to have a health care facility. And uh, so I, 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 what I'm interested in is bringing those three components across all of Mississippi so that we can attract people to move to Mississippi, to have a family here and a career and, and, and bring a business. And so I'm happy to be here with each of you today, and thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Our next panelist is Dr. Vernon Rayford. Dr. Rayford is from Holly Springs, Mississippi. He has a doctorate in pharmacy from the University of Mississippi and a doctorate in medicine from, the University, from Vanderbilt University. He works as a primary care physician in Tupelo and also serves as medical director for the Advanced Practice Clinician Fellowship Program at MM, NMHS and Good Samaritan Health Services. Dr. Rayford, Dr. Rayford uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Jarvis. Um, I'm humbled to be on a panel. Um, I am a physician, and I'd like to bring the perspective of a physician taking care of people, um, both in my primary clinic, but also as a physician who's actively involved in the community with many of the safety net programs, particularly Good Samaritan Health Services, Catch Kids, Tree of Life. And just to talk about um, there is an aspiration as a physician that I take care of patients regardless of insurance status. Um, and that's a lifelong professional aspiration that I have. I want to do the best I can for everybody regardless of their insurance status. The reality, however, is that insurance status, being insured, having access to insurance really does matter. And it does make an impact on the care of people. And the other reality is safety net programs are not enough for the number of people that need health care. Thank you, Dr. Rayford. Our next panelist is Jamie Raspberry. She is the policy coordinator for Mississippi Alliance of Nonprofits. And as in, in that position, she leads the policy unit, manages the education, health, workforce development, family economic, security affinity groups that focus on increased learning, collaboration, and funding around critical policy issues. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Jarvis. Um, happy to be here and excited to really bring the perspective of our uh, nonprofits and our philanthropy community across the state and specific to Medicaid expansion and how um, the our nonprofits really are carrying a lot of the weight that underinsured or uninsured people in Mississippi um, have. And so if you think about um, someone who doesn't have insurance, but they have health issues or health care needs um, in the, especially in rural communities, they're going to these local nonprofits and looking for support and services there. And so it's just a, um, on top of the programs that our nonprofits are already providing, it's just kind of an extra burden that they have to pick up some of the pieces um, and the funding that, that they don't have to provide these services. So it's kind of the cyclical effect that's going on here. So I'm, I'm really excited that we get to represent our nonprofits and our funders across the state and kind of give them a voice at the table in these conversations. Thank you, Jamie. Our final panelist is Shane Spees. Shane is the president and CEO of North Mississippi Health Services. He came to Tupelo from Baptist Health System in Birmingham, where he served as president and CEO from 2007 to 2013. Mr. Spees. Thank you, Jarvis. And uh, I too am humbled to be part of this panel and appreciate everyone dedicating their time and efforts to providing more education and, and conversation around a very important 
subject. And, um, you know, being in healthcare and working with the Dr. Rayfords and others who are caring for the patients, we see firsthand the impact of the lack of healthcare insurance coverage. And I know that the topic is Medicaid expansion, but as we'll talk about probably later, that um, a number of states have used different alternatives to expand healthcare insurance coverage access across the across the country. And, and so I, I just want to make sure that as part of the conversation this afternoon, and hopefully I and several others will touch on this, there is a direct correlation between access to affordable health care insurance coverage and an individual's health, as Dr. Rayford pointed out. And so in order for us to become a healthier community um, and a more productive community, then we have to address the access to health insurance coverage. And so I look forward to the opportunity to talk with the panel this afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Shane. Um, a little housekeeping. So we are live streaming on Facebook and what we're gonna to try to do is take some questions from Facebook. Um, in the comment section, you can just drop a question or any comment and we'll try to get to that towards the end of the uh, panel discussion. And hopefully we can just have a free ranging discussion of uh, different issues, but I'm just gonna throw out some topics and, you know, Please feel, feel free to jump in. Um, no, no need to raise your hand or anything like that. So first topic I, I did want to bring up, I, I feel like uh, we need to set the foundation for you know, what we're talking about and what we expect out of our government um, here in the state of Mississippi and whether or not this is something, healthcare is something the, the state uh, should be involved in as far as providing health insurance. So. In Mississippi, about 46% of Mississippians uh, receive their health insurance through their employer, 18% through the current Medicaid program, 16% through Medicare, 2% through military, and around 12% are uninsured. So that's about 350,000 Mississippians that don't have health insurance. Um, so to start, um, do how does the panel feel about the government having a role in, in providing health insurance, and is, is that something that we should take on as a collective through our, our government, or is that a, a private concern? I'd be happy, Jarvis, to, to address that and, and then turn it over to others, but um, the, uh, the government um, essentially made that decision about their role in health care insurance coverage in 1965 when they approved when they created and approved Medicare and Medicaid programs. And then the states subsequently, all 50 states created uh, and approved Medicaid within their respective states uh, in less than two years um, from that passage in 1965. And as you pointed out, we've had 38 other states affirm that commitment and role in health insurance coverage by expanding their existing Medicaid programs or working with the federal government to use those federal funds to apply it to expand health insurance coverage to their residents within their state. So that was an affirmation that there is the, a role for government in health insurance coverage. And then I would say that, you know, we, Medicare and Medicaid have been around for 56 years now. And as we know, single parties have had the political positioning and leverage to have eliminated uh, Medicaid over the years if they wanted to do that or they felt like there was not a role for government in health insurance coverage. But um, as I mentioned, the programs are still alive and well today. A number of states have expanded uh, up, upon those programs. And so there clearly there's a role for government in this. Any comments from any of the other panelists? I'd just like to add that um, in, in terms of thinking of particular groups um, that we've collectively, and so you know, me not being in government, but being one who, uh, who does believe that the government, the government has an opportunity to, you know, to take care of what the priorities are and health is an important priority. And just thinking about programs 
Um, we do have a model for saying children should have health insurance. And the CHIPS program and Medicaid program, we've done a great job in many states um, of improving the coverage of children. And the question I have as a physician who is trained in pediatrics and internal medicine, what happens at age 18? You know, what happens at age 18 that we now no longer say you need the health care coverage? And so why, you know, the, my question is always, you know, what changes at age 18 that we all agree that children need? Um, children need access to health care and through, to get that access is through insurance, um, immunizations, well child development, um, behavioral um, kind of monitoring, school monitoring, those are so important. And my question for those, you know, who, you know, my question or my concern is that at age 18, the need doesn't stop. Thank you, Dr. Reifert. Um, Jamie, you mentioned that, um, you know, you're coming into this from the perspective of the nonprofit community. Um, what capacity does the nonprofit uh, world have to kind of address, um, address this issue or to provide assistance to folks that don't have health insurance through their job or private health insurance? Yeah, um, and I, I want to piggyback real quick on what Dr. Rayford just uh, touched on, uh, you know, beyond just healthcare um, access or insurance provision for those that are aging in out of the juvenile system or um, into adulthood when they turn 18, you know, there's a, there's a lot more resources that are kind of cut off at that age that really need to be provided. Um, you know, especially children that are aging out of the foster care system or aging out of like Palmer Home for Children. Um, and essentially they're just kind of cut loose and they, they don't have the resources that they need to set them up for success. There's a lot of people that are working really hard to provide resources and kind of this sustainable plan for those that are, you know, turning 18 and kind of embarking out on the world. Um, I think that's a whole bigger issue and a whole bigger um, conversation that should happen. But healthcare is one of the key things that these young people are lacking. And, you know, most of them are kind of starting out in, um, you know, low paying jobs or entry level positions where they don't, they're not provided insurance through those jobs. And so I think addressing that um, is a great place for us to start us collectively as, you know, just people that have influence and um, getting our uh, key decision makers to understand that that's, that's a gap right there. It's not just about uninsured people that have had insurance in the past or have been eligible for Medicaid or whatever, but like, you know, kind of touching on what you said, um, Shane, about, um, I'm sorry, not Representative McMahon, about, uh, you know, if we want people to thrive in our state and we want our communities to be successful, that's the generation that we need to set up for success that we're not doing a very good job of right now. Um, so I'll pivot back to your question and just talking about our nonprofits in the state that are really kind of the catch-all, especially in some of these small com communities where we've got um, most, of, most of them are faith-based communities faith-based organizations, faith-based nonprofits, churches, um, you know, just really grassroots on the ground, kind of in the trenches, picking up the slack everywhere that they, um, that there is a need to do that. And so they are uh, feeding people. They are, you know, right now, everybody's doing uh, vaccines. They are meeting basic needs of helping people pay their light bill, helping people pay their gas bill, um, providing services for children, um, you know, going into this whole virtual learning world that we've been in for the last year, two years as well. And so our nonprofits are really struggling with being able to just stay on top, being able to just keep up, being able to have the funding um, to continue the services that they were offering before and now you kind of layer all of these other issues that our world is um, you know facing right now and it just 
puts more of a burden on our our nonprofits. Um, as I mentioned, you know earlier that there nonprofits rely on individual donors and um, some corporate donations, some foundation grants, and some government grants. But that's really the you know how they sustain the model that they have. And so if you are just kind of covering the basis of what you're providing and then on top of that you layer the needs that are continuing to knock on your door but you don't have the funding to support that um, you know they just end up not being able to do everything that they could because they don't have the staff they don't have the funding they don't have the capacity and the needs just keep coming and so, you know, what we do at the Alliance, you know, our mission is to serve our nonprofits across the state, help build capacity with, within their organization. And then how can we better connect our nonprofits to the funders, especially with the in, increase in needs that we've seen over the last two years. And so we are really trying to, to better connect and um, create better collaboration so that the our nonprofits have opportunities to be able to meet those needs without struggling day to day as they have been over the last couple of years. Thank you, Jamie. Um, that um, that question about what happens at age 18 that Dr. Rayford mentioned, it uh, prompted me to look at some of the numbers that we have um, gathered about who's covered with Medicaid and, and the CHIP program. So currently uh, about 700,000 Mississippians are covered by Medicaid or CHIP. About 67% of those are children. So unless you're, an un, unless you're disabled, a childless adult cannot qualify for Mississippi's Medicaid program. Uh, a parent can qualify if they earn less than 21% of the federal poverty level um, for a family of three, that's $4,600 a year. So most of the low-income workers in Mississippi, people that, um, that Jamie was mentioning, uh, clerks, cashiers, grocery store workers, uh, they make too much to qualify for our current Medicaid program, and they make too little to qualify for the Affordable Care Act programs, um, those health, private health insurance marketplaces. So you know, we got into this a little bit, but what are these Mississippians doing uh, for healthcare right now? Um, even though they don't have health insurance, they still get sick, they still get ill, and they're still in accidents. What, what, is, what does that look like in Mississippi right now if you're one of these uninsured adults? So uh, <clears throat> I'll go. Um, many people employ a variety of tactics. Um, the first one is they forego care altogether. Um, the next one, um, you forego primary care, but lean towards sick care. Um, you're only seen when things are bad. Um, by not having primary care, when things go wrong, that may not be the emergency. You end up utilizing emergency services like the emergency room for things that could have been handled in primary care. Um, and, and, and then the other scenario is um, um, which, you know, again, there's just not enough. You access those safety nets in the community. Good Samaritan Health Services, Catch Kids, Tree of Life, and there are many more. I'm just talking about three that I know of in Tupelo. You access those services. Um, again, it's just not enough of those services. Each of those services are not for profit. Each of those services are competing for, um, you know, the, the, charitable donations and the, the support of, of clinicians um, and um, it's just not enough for um, for that. And if you know you want a real life story, you know, of, of what a person could look like, um, a young mo mother with type one diabetes who's not able to afford insulin. Um, she can't afford insulin. She starts working, but she can't afford insulin. She gets sick before her 90 day insurance period uh, goes up. She has to be hospitalized first from the emergency room, high cost, to the ICU, to the regular floor for three to four days. Because she's missed three to four days of work, she loses that job. 
And so the cycle repeats that she's unable to be healthy enough for three months for her insurance to kick in. Now, her options are to keep on that cycle. Um, other options are to access those safety nets. But again, because of, of constraints, the safety nets can't serve everybody who has that need. And, and I would piggyback on you again that the safety net is our nonprofit community across the state. And so for this particular mother, now she's having to go get food for her and her children and her family at a local food pantry. She's having to go to a, um, a, a, a clothing closet to be able to you know, find clothes for her children. She's looking for resources for extra support for her kids and who's keeping her children while she's in the hospital and who is going to help her when she's home and not able to work. You know, so that's where it just that cycle just kind of starts kicking in where, um, you know, if she had coverage that it would take the burden off of her a little bit to be able to not have to worry about how she's going to provide for her children because all of this other stuff is happening and so if she's, you know, in a, there's a clock in the background. So if she is in a place where she just knows I have health coverage that's going to take care of me while I'm sick, it's going to provide my medication. It, I don't have, a, you know, a, a thousands and dollars of medical bills that's going to be, you know, coming to my door, then I can do what I need to stress a little bit less stressful to take care of my children and my family. Shane, well, what does that look like um, as far as hospitals? How, how do you all, how are you all impacted by folks putting off care or um, not being insured and seeking emergency care? Yeah, well, Dr. Rayford was spot on in, in talking through the cycle um, and, and using the story of the individual he's very familiar with. We see it every single day. And just to put it into perspective, about 30% of visits to our emergency rooms are among people who do, do not have coverage. Um, so that makes up 30% of those visits. And the majority of those visits are for primary care type needs and non, not emergent um, or emergency needs there. So clearly they seek the ER for primary care services as, as the typical way to seek health care, uh, which we know is not the best way to utilize health care. Um, it's certainly more expensive and you're typically behind the eight ball um, once you've come in after you're ill. And a lot of times those patients are come in so late in the illness that it's very difficult for them to recover, um, as Dr. Rayford um, can, can um, point to. But also you know that expensive ER visit just puts them back even further in their own individual financial situation. And so we know that medical debt is the highest cause for individual personal bankruptcies now. And so it's just, it's that vicious cycle that Dr. Rayford mentioned. You know, it's interesting that, that you know, 55% of the adults that are currently covered by our Medicaid program in the state are working in the state of Mississippi. Now, those are the ones that are eligible for, for coverage under Medicaid. That doesn't account for the hundreds of thousands of Mississippians that are actively working, but they fall in that coverage gap. You mentioned earlier, Jarvis, that either they, they make too much to qualify for Medicaid and make too little to qualify for the health insurance exchange marketplace and to get subsidies there. So that is a, uh, we see it every single day. Um, and it's and it's not just the the impact of that individual needing care immediately, but it's that follow up impact that you know if they have a, a chronic illness that needs follow up care, you know weeks and months later and possibly ongoing for a lifetime, if they can't access that follow up care, then it just puts them in a deeper hole in terms of uh, financially as well as from a health status standpoint. Senator McMahon, you mentioned in your opening statement about um, you know healthcare being one of the economic drivers that you look at. This issue of um, folks putting off care or not being able to get treatment, how do you think that impacts the state economy overall? 
First, I'd like to go back and share just a thought about what Director Raspberry said, that there were a lot of nonprofits in the state that were taking up the gap for health care. I want to take the opportunity to brag on North Mississippi Health Services. Many people in this region do not realize that they, they write off, they give away $100 million a year in health services to those who are not covered in this state. And they should be applauded for that. And, and, and I speak with the, with the hospital regularly. I, I listen intently to what's taking place. And I am so grateful that we have the largest rural health system in America, in this area, and that they're committed to the health of Northeast Mississippi, and that they give away $100 million a year in health services. So thank you for that, Shane, and to, and to your board at North Mississippi. I, I want to, I, I do want to share something. I, I'm not necessarily for healthcare. I'm not necessarily for the expansion of Medicaid. What I am for is bringing healthcare to and access to healthcare to all Mississippians. The federal government voted to create a Medicaid and Medicare health program in 1965. Mississippi began our Medicaid on January 1st of 1970. It is a minimum insurance, uh, it is a minimum insurance program for those who are uninsured. And the vast majority of those on Medicaid today in Mississippi are children. And I know earlier someone mentioned about a single mom or a single dad. Families, and to quote King Solomon in the Bible, the best thing, to, King Solomon said two is better than one. It is better for people to be married and to have a healthy, intact family. There's a whole lot of economics that play into that. But so I, I do, what I am for is, it's been three presidents since the Affordable Care Act passed. And I would like to see a blue ribbon commission formed with legislators, with hospitals, with nonprofits, with individuals across the state. I would like to all come together and have an exchange of ideas on how we can bring health care to Mississippi. I, I want to share something. I want everyone here to hear me. I think everyone here is from Mississippi. No one's coming here to help us, guys. We got to help ourselves as Mississippians. We got to work together. And we're not going to agree. I bet right now, if we named 10 things, we probably wouldn't agree, but on two, two or three of those 10 items, if we, if we, if we listed the things that were important to each, to each of us. But let's focus on the two or three items that we agree on and let's give those 100% of our effort. And healthcare should be one of those. Healthcare is not a man or woman or Democrat or Republican issue. It's a it's a it's a it's an everybody issue. Everybody needs health care. And so when you say Medicaid expansion, people immediately, you know, they get in their groups and they start fighting back and forth. I think what we need to do is sit down and come up with a comprehensive program of what we can do working together as Mississippians to bring health care to all Mississippians. And I also want to thank, you know, the earlier Dr. Rayford mentioned that, you know, Mississippi receives, for every dollar we spend on health care in Medicaid, we get $3 from the federal government. And that's because of the work and strength of Senator Thad Cochran and Senator Roger Wicker. We're, we're, we get more money for health care from the federal government than any other state in the country. And they should be applauded for their work, but that's where I'd like to see us go is I would like to, and we're going to have Medicaid hearings this summer in the state Senate, but I'd like to broaden those committee hearings to include a large group of individuals and let's come up with a plan on how we can provide better health care and better health care outcomes for our Mississippi families. Thank you, Senator. Any, um, Comments or responses from any other any other panelists? Yeah, Jarvis, if I could just add on to that, I, I just want to make sure that that uh, it is a complex issue, um, and uh, so there are really no simple solutions. If so, we we would have implemented those years ago. Um, but I want to make sure that 
that we keep and try to simplify a very complex issue into several components. And this is how I see the relationship and the importance of health insurance coverage or health coverage, because coverage leads to access. Access leads to better utilization of health care, and that ultimately leads to better health. And so, you know, I don't want us to say that just giving somebody access to health care is it. It's they have to have coverage, health insurance coverage, call it what you want, but it's essentially health insurance coverage that affords them the access. And so, you know, that's that's the the point of this discussion. And to me, that's where it all starts, is that if we if we want ultimately to have a healthier public, we have to have a better health insurance coverage system in the state. Let, let me jump in and share something, what Shane just, what Shane was explaining. Um, Medicaid is the largest budget item in the state budget. And there was an idea, I, this is not my idea, someone else brought this to my attention and they said, you know, Chad, for what we're spending on Medicaid, we could provide a private insurance, a private insurance policy for every single Mississippian. That's an incredible statement in itself. And that is part of why I want to have a, med, a Medicaid or medical understanding of what's taking place and how we can provide every Mississippian health care coverage, whether that be through a Medicaid or a Medicare or through the private sector. But if, if, if we continue to break into groups and just argue over how to proceed instead of all meeting together and having a plan on how to proceed, there's a lot of good ideas out there. We, we just need the opportunity to sit down and talk about it. And, and that's my position. And, and that's why I'm interested in what we can do to provide coverage to every Mississippian. So for folks watching on Facebook or recording, how do we get to that conversation and what can they do um, to help foster that conversation with our state leaders? Well, Mr. Deutsch, you know, uh, I would like to start that conversation. I've called for public hearings on Medicaid for the last two years, really for the last four years. And the Honorable Lieutenant Governor Delbert Hosen is going to, and, and, and uh, Senator Blackwell are going to initiate those hearings this year. So to, to see, you know, how we move forward. But I think we need a larger committee system, a blue ribbon committee, from individuals across the entire state, for healthcare providers, insurance providers, Medicaid recipients, you know, everyone needs to have a voice at the table. And this is probably something that will take a year to put to put all the facts and figures together. Uh, but we, we we need to have these conversations on what we can do to help every Mississippian have healthcare coverage. For those who are opposed to Medicaid. And I've got critics out there who like to, who, who, you know, who say, oh no, you should be no Medicaid. When their own family members become unemployed or in a situation where they get pregnant out of wedlock and they suddenly need Medicaid, the whole, their, their, their whole position changes. So what I wanna do, like I said, we need to figure out a way to provide a healthcare insurance program that, to every Mississippian. And I'd like to add to that, you know, I think a, a good starting place is really just to create a, a, a better narrative around what Medicaid is, because even for myself, before I was really aware and educated on the healthcare system, you know, when I heard Medicaid, I just thought poor people. I mean, that's what my mind initially, you know, thought. And I think so many people still think that when they hear the word Medicaid. And so I think we just need to kind of rewrite the narrative about what it is. Um, and I'll just share personally that last year, I worked for a for-profit healthcare 
organization based out of Nashville, Tennessee for 13 years. And at the onset of COVID was on, was put on furlough for several months and ultimately, um, you know, was laid off at the end of that. And during my furlough, I did not have health coverage for many months. And I have a, I'm a single mother of a four-year-old. And during that time, I'd applied for Medicaid, if not for me, but for my daughter, just in case she needed it, you know, being young, you just don't know what may happen and was denied based on my income. And, um, you know, for several months, I just didn't have coverage and was just hoping and praying that we were healthy and nothing happened and we didn't get COVID and, you know, no accidents or anything. Um, and then when I was laid off, I did get a severance, which reinstated my coverage during my severance period. Um, and up until I took the job with the Alliance last year, you know, there were many months where I just was thankful that nothing happened. And, you know, I think that's part of the narrative that we need to tell too. It's not just for poor people. It's not just for um, unwed mothers. It's not just for the elderly people. It's for people like me that just because life happens and things in the world happen that I was put in a situation where I just didn't have coverage for a period of time. And thankfully, you know, I had a safe, I have a, a safety net that if something did happen, we would be okay. But it did add another level of stress to my life, just on top of everything else that I was going through at the time. And, you know, it really made me think about all the others that um, they don't have a safety net if something happens. They, they don't have another job on the horizon that would provide health coverage for them or their family. And so I really think that as we have these conversations um, and as the, um, our leaders and our, you know, the legislative process is, you know, open and willing to talking about it, that the narrative just really needs to be changed and really better shared so that everybody on both sides really understands what Medicaid is and the needs that it would cover for those that are in situations like I was. Director Raspberry, that is a great point. Any one of us could lose our jobs and be hurt in a car wreck, and you'd have to have that minimum coverage. Um, my own family in 1985, I, I personally was hurt and we didn't have health insurance. And uh, I had a, a, a tw my family had a 20, I was in the, um, I guess I was in the ninth grade. I had a $20,000 invoice with North Mississippi Medical Center. And $20,000 today doesn't sound like a lot of money, but I see Dr. Rayford laughing. If he knows yeah. in 1985, $20,000 would buy two Chevrolet pickups. Yeah. Today, it wouldn't even buy a piece of one. Not a new one, but it was a very scary time for my family, and it scarred me. It, it really did. It scarred me for my to see my dad and my family, my my mom and dad, go through that. And um, again, to brag on North Mississippi, my dad, my dad paid that paid that paid on that note for three years until it was paid off at no interest, uh, thanks to the great health system in this area. But you know, I'm. This is real. This is people's lives. And anyone, anyone is one accident away or one job termination away from needing some type of minimum health coverage in this state. And, and thank you. Thank you, Director Raspberry, for sharing that. And, you know, I, I, um, I know exactly how you feel because I, I, re I remember those days. Seeing my family, it's upsetting to me because seeing my mom and dad at the table wondering, you know, how they were going to pay some bills and pay that and pay that 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 healthcare bill I had as well at the time. So, um, being without healthcare is scary in this environment. Thank you. Um, I think there's. One thing I'd like to bring up about the, the discussion around um, having a broad discussion about this issue, you know, in 1969, um, as Senator McMahon mentioned, Mississippi did not take up the Medicaid uh, program when it was first passed in 1965. 1969, um, Governor John Bell Williams went, went around the state with a blue ribbon commit commission and toured the state talking about um, 
Medicaid and healthcare in Mississippi. And this was something he voted against when he was in Congress, but he decided to um, go around the state, get input. And in 1970, he called a special session. Well, 1969, called a special session and got Medicaid passed. So there's the ability to do this. Um, I think we just, you know, have to see it, um, you know, whoever it is, um, push forward with the, you know, have the willpower to push this thing forward because we've actually seen it done in Mississippi. Um, and I think we've gotten to this a bit with some of the comments, but since we are, I think there's a, a knowledge about what Mississippi is with healthcare and um, how it affects our hospitals and health outcomes, you know, what is the main driver um, about, main driver that you all see as blocking this type of discussion or um, blocking us from, you know, if it's Medicaid expansion or if it's, you know, some other type of program, um, what's blocking us from taking on this big issue? Well, I'm happy to kick it off and, and then uh, let others chime in. But um, I think um, I think number one, it, it's a uh, it's a community need that's com competing against many other community needs that the legislature has to deal with. And, and I can appreciate um, the volume of work and the number of issues that they have to, to deal with. So I think that's a factor. Um, that plays in it. And I think Jamie raised up a good point earlier in terms of the perception of who Medicaid covers and what it does is part of the issue. And, and I think it, 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 it makes people think that it's less important than it really is. Um, and so I think, you know, people understanding, investing the time and effort to do what we're doing today is have the conversation around okay, what is Medicaid? Who participates in Medicaid? And what are we missing as a state, um, given where our current Medicaid program is and its eligibility, you know, what do we need to do in addition to that um, to give folks access to health coverage and therefore access to health care? But the third factor is purely politics. I mean, we all, we all know that. Um, and um, whether it's because of um, opposition to a certain law of, of American, I mean, of the Affordable Care Act, or it's the terminology Medicaid expansion. It's just purely politics, because if you look at both the business case and the health case for expansion of health care coverage, uh, it's a no-brainer. Um, and that's why you've seen 38 states pass the expansion in a variety of different forms, as, as Senator McMahon pointed out earlier, some have expanded on their traditional Medicaid program. Others have used the private insurance market to expand coverage across their state. Um, so clearly there's, there's a need to be met out there and, and hopefully we can dive in and talk about, I mean, there's, there's over 600 studies that have been done in the short decade that Medicaid expansion has been in place over 600 different studies that have analyzed the impact of expansion of Medicaid in those states from a business standpoint, from a financial impact on the state standpoint to the individual's health standpoint. So those studies are out there and provide a lot of clear insight that it's a very good policy decision for the state to make. It's very good for individuals' health, well-being, and financial security and ultimately, it's positive for the state's economy. So um, I'll, I'll stop there and then allow others to chime in. And I'd like to, I'd like to add, you know, the question of why aren't we, I think if you look at 1965 Centers for Medicare, Medicaid, the Medicare and Medicaid, and if you contrast where Medicare is now and where Medicaid is now, you know, one thing that comes up is how the program has been run since 1965. And so as a physician, you know, I will be honest and say that my patients with Medicaid coverage, taking care of them is challenging because 
there can be some restrictions in terms of number of prescriptions, number of things that are accessible that aren't there with other insurers. Now, I'm not saying that only Medicaid has, has restrictions. As a physician, I've learned that you know, there, there's restrictions, there's different sets of criteria, um, different kind of approaches with different insurers. But I do think that historically how Medicaid has been promoted, how it's been run in contrast to how Medicare has been promoted and run, you know, adds to the argument where you may have physicians who are acutely aware that my whole county will not have a hospital because there's not a lot of good coverage. Um, you know, hospitals are shutting down because of large, the population can't afford it. They're not covered, but also aren't in favor of expanding Medicaid as it is. And so uh, one challenge would be asking, why have we allowed Medicaid and Medicare to kind of occupy two different ends of the spectra? Now it's, it's really, really politically untenable to make any restrictive changes, I think, to Medicare. You know, to pull something out of Medicare would not be something that's very, very popular. But on the flip side, Medicaid, you know, you know essentially that's, that, that's been run differently. And so, you know, I would say that one challenge has been just kind of has been how Medicaid has been um, just how Medicaid programs and I'm speaking of Medicaid in different states. So I trained for residency in Massachusetts at a time when the precursor to the Affordable Care Act was in, in, in place. So, you know, if you allow me to call it Romney Care. So I trained in Massachusetts, also trained in Tennessee, um, and as well as Mississippi. And in all of those places, Medicaid had a different feel or a different run or a different perception than Medicare in all of those places. And I think that also influences the, the discussion because for many, there's a knee jerk reaction to Medicaid as it is. And so, you know, you're saying, do I want as restrictive practice as I'm in, you know, involved in, do I want that to increase? So on that issue, like that's, I mean, I hate to be so blunt about it, but does it come down to, you know, people, Medicaid covers a lot of children, low income folks, people that don't vote, can't vote. Medicare covers older folks who vote at a much higher rate than the general public. This just comes down to, you know, these people vote. So, um, politicians are more um, responsive to their, their demands and needs. And, and you get that as far as, you see that as a doctor, um, how it plays out. Hey Shane, I don't know if you're still there, but I had a, um, a follow-up question to what you, um, you mentioned about data from other states that have expanded Medicaid or done some uh, alternative to traditional Medicaid expansion. Uh, one of the things people have argued um, is that just because you have coverage, that doesn't equate to care. That you know, people can you can put people on med, um, give people a health insurance card through Medicaid, but that doesn't mean they're going to actually get better health care, get better out outcomes. What are we seeing in some other states that um, you know take that on? As you mentioned, there have been so hundreds of studies. Um, since Medicaid expansion has been a, a thing that um, has gone into effect. Yeah, and, and for those who, who like to look at the information and the data, um, the Kaiser Family Foundation is a great website. Um, and the Kaiser Family Foundation um, has, has, over the years, um, analyzed all of these studies and developed some some perspectives or outcomes from those studies that they highlight from it. And so um, as they've looked at these hundreds of studies, um, there are several conclusions that they report on. They, they have concluded based on the studies um, that expansion is directly linked to gains in health care coverage. It's directly linked to improvements in access to care. It's directly linked to financial security of individual residents. Uh, and it's directly linked to a number of improvements in health status and conditions of those individuals. Plus, 
uh, um, an improvement in the or has yielded positive economic benefits to both states and the providers, hospitals and doctors and others in those states. And so just from, from that standpoint, as you look at the data, um, Kaiser Family Foundation has tracked and they trend all of that. And those are the outcomes that they pulled from the hundreds of studies that they've reviewed. We can talk more specifically about some of that, but uh, it was interesting that those were the conclusions they drew after reviewing hundreds of those studies. Thank you, Shane. And, and I think there have been studies, you know, even dealing with folks filing for bankruptcy, um, medical debt. When you know, presenter we have from the University of Michigan, when I was in the legislature, talked about their experience in, in that state with individuals having less debt because of you know less outstanding um, medical bills. But you know, Medicaid expansion has been a thing since 2014. So a lot of this, you know, there's good information and data out there to influence decision, decision making. Um, I have a question that's come in from the chat, I believe, um, and it deals with our, our healthcare system and the fact that our healthcare system does, um, what well, the question says, lose up to $100 million a year and stay in business. Um, that number may not be, you know, um, correct, or you may see different numbers here in Mississippi, but I think the overall, the the point of the question is, um, how does the healthcare system survive when it's losing so much money because of uncompensated care? Um, it, it's, it's more challenging every day. <laughs> and I will tell you, and Dr. Rayford's been around it long enough to know that uh, um, the current year is even more challenging than the previous year. Uh, but part of this is, is why um, private um, health insurance premiums are so high uh, is there's some cost shifting, they call it. So just like we all pay a portion of our automobile insurance to cover uninsured motorist coverage, right? To get uninsured motorist coverage. Essentially, that's what we also have in the private health insurance market is we're essentially helping cover some of this uncompensated care cost um, through your insurance premiums. So make up for it um, by the private insurance side. Um, in fact, private insurance is the only area where we make a profit, if you will, uh, from the services that we deliver. Um, everything else, both Medicare, Medicaid, you know, we lose money on delivering those services. So we have to challenge ourselves year in and year out of how do we continue to be uh, as efficient as we possibly can? How do we try to make the best decisions and provide the right level of health care for an individual. Um, and, but it continues to get harder and harder um, as margins continue to get squeezed. Um, we can no longer rely on that cost shifting that's, that has occurred in the past in the private health insurance marketplace because the insurance companies are no longer willing to absorb that or pass along that to their insured members. So that's even becoming more and more challenging um, today. I'd, I'd like to speak uh, again from the perspective of our nonprofits in the state here too. And as we are uh, the statewide organization for nonprofits, we ourselves are a nonprofit. And so every month, um, you know, when I have to pay my, my portion of my insurance for myself and my daughter, I'm just like, Oh, I hate having to pay all this every month, but I understand that it's necessary uh, just to help our health system continue to provide services. Um, but there are a lot of nonprofits, especially the smaller ones in these smaller communities that have very few staff that they can provide insurance, but they are not able to, to fully pay it for their staff. And so it, you know, it, it, it kind of is another level of burden that's put on our serve, direct service providers um, for their own staff that are having to pay for their health insurance. And, you know, they're serving the direct need of people in these communities that don't have insurance. And they, they, they understand it, they get it because while they may have coverage, there's still a burden on them just individually. Um, and so I, I wanna touch or ask a question, I guess, uh, uh, regarding the closure of our rural hospitals 
in the state and just the crisis that, that that is across the country right now. And I know just in Mississippi, um, I think we've had about six close in the last, you know, 10 or 12 years. And, um, you know, I know a lot of them are still at risk for closing across the state. And I think I saw that there was like 600 million in uncompensated care in 2019 as a direct result of that. And so, um, how do you, in these communities, in these rural areas where these hospitals and these health systems are closing, you know, it kind of perpetuates a whole other issue where they're having to drive for care, they're having to, they're not receiving care at all, especially if they're uninsured. And so are you seeing in your health system uh, taking in a, a number of people from these communities where they've lost a rural hospital or lost, lost access to care um, because you are kind of in a rural area outside of the Tupelo um, city. So what does that look like for you and your health system? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so yeah, we see the effects in terms of people having to travel and migrate farther to access our services uh, because an area hospital uh, may have closed. And it's not just us. I mean, we've had closures. There have been clo hospital closures across the state. And so any other hospital that's uh, still open in that area have likely uh, received those patients or community members who, who may have accessed that hospital that closed in the past but now need to access services. It just presents a greater challenge for individuals to access health care. At the end of the day, you've, if you have fewer hospitals and fewer emergency departments, uh, which means you also have fewer physicians and providers available in that community to care for folks, it just has a significantly negative impact on access to health care. Yeah. And I think um, kind of on the ground, one reality in those communities is that they even have less access to emergency care. And so you think about committees, uh, ch uh, communities, Chickasaw County, you know, in particular, um, I've done some volunteer work in Quitman County, Mississippi. And just thinking about what do you do when something emergent happens, you know, for those families who aren't able to take the relative and to put them in the car, you know, you think about just ambulance drivers. If there is not a rural hospital, that, you know, there's not a hospital in that community, you're tying up an ambulance that has to travel twice or three times the distance to get and so if someone else is in need you know at the same time that the ambulance is on the way to Memphis or you know in our scenario on the way from rural Chickasaw County to Tupelo you know you have an issue where a very important emergency resource is being tied up um, because there's not a closer option and you know another reality I had a chance to talk to the coroner from um, from Quitman County and who, who, you know, we talked about COVID a little, but she was saying, well, we already had a high rate of people who are, you know, people who die in their own homes. So people who are found suddenly dead in their own home, not able to access, you know, and she was able to tie it to not having an emergency, you know, not having any close resources and she just talked about how that increased, that the number of people who were dying suddenly at home had increased with the, uh, with the COVID pandemic. So see, one of those consequences that, you know, in the most extreme moments when it comes to health, it really depends on where you are in terms of how fast those emergency services. And so you hear those tragic stories of people dying of preventable things like asthma attacks. So people in rural communities dying of asthma attacks that if only they live, you know, in a, another part or in a community that had resources that could quickly um, treat the asthma attack, you wouldn't have that bad outcome. Dr. Jarvis, did you know that the Quitman County Hospital just reopened? Yep. Yep. Right. Well, I was I was fortunate to be part of that. That goes back to what I was sharing with you that uh, we've got to help ourselves. A local private Mississippi investor partnered with the Board of Supervisors 
and they reopened that eight eight room eight bed hospital with 12 minutes left on the con it was incredible and we're looking at some cutting edge legislation this year to help perpetually fund and ensure the viability of that hospital it was a game changer for that county to reopen that that eight bedroom hospital it employs 40 professionals those are high paying jobs and now it puts that county back in the game to attract a, a, a organizations and businesses to move there because nobody was moving equipment in mississippi to march mississippi because there was no health service there so uh no primary health so uh, i was so happy to be part of that and it really needs to be held up as an example of what we can do when we choose to work together and pull together and when we can reopen some of these small hospitals. Thank you, Sandra. Had another question that came in from the chat. Um, this one dealing with the commission that Senator McMahon mentioned, um, the idea of a commission. Um, is there one issue that would generate some common ground discussion among, among legislators? And I'm thinking this is one issue in particular related to healthcare um, that could be a catalyst to get people uh, moving on, on this issue. And it might even be what we just discussed right now about the issue of rural hospitals throughout the, the um, rural hospitals throughout the state struggling. Well, there was an issue recently on the ballot and 74% of Mississippians voted for that issue. So it was a priority for the legislature and we're gonna get that done this year. And I think when the majority of Mississippians understand the value of healthcare and the importance of healthcare to their region, then they will encourage their legislators, you know, to have, and, 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 their, and, and their statewide elected officials to have these hearings. But, you know, I'm doing all I can to to bring this issue forward and for us to have a blue ribbon commission so that we can have a broader conversation about how how to provide uh, health care to all Mississippians and to our families. Any comments from the other panelists? So one um, thing about the, the and then this may be a question for Shane. Um, I think the rural hospital issue is something that's you know nationwide and not just um, confined to Mississippi. Um, there are a lot of challenges in there, and I think rural communities are facing challenges outside of just healthcare. Like you know, I, I used to represent part of Utica in, in Hines County, and there was a, the difficulty in just recruiting teachers and having teachers travel sixty. 60 minutes just to, to come to work. Um, these rural communities are facing some really um, cha tough challenges in for, as far as recruiting people to work in their area, um, work in their communities or um, keeping folks to stay there. Um, have we seen any evidence that Medicaid expansion plays any difference in states um, when it comes to these um, outcomes of rural communities? It has, and part, part of the studies that I referenced earlier have looked at that, and, uh, and they've shown that in particular, um, expansion of health coverage, um, we refer to here today as Medicaid expansion, has greatly improved the economic situation within the rural areas, um, because you're dealing with rural areas that primarily have an older population, of course, less population, but also lower income um, in the areas. And so the expansion, again, gave them access to that coverage, which gave them access to care. Um, and also it supported providing healthcare services in that local community um, and keeping that, that service and keeping the, those revenues in that community uh, to support jobs and to support um, the tax base and that sort of thing. So there's clearly a, been a direct relationship uh, and a positive impact in those expanded states um, in the rural markets. 
I don't think we've really got into the specifics when we talk about, you know, alternatives to, to traditional Medicaid expansion. Can you speak a little bit about what those um, alternatives look like and look like looks like in other states that have um, taken up this option? Yeah, so, so uh, a number of states just expanded their existing Medicaid programs, while others um, sought a, a waiver from, from Medicare and Medicaid services agency to to do a different form. So I, I look to Arkansas often as the example, and I lift their, their model up um, as what I, what I would say is the preferred model. Um, if you ask me today, you know, how would we do this in Mississippi? I would say, let's follow the Arkansas model. So what they did is they got the waiver from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and said, we want to take your federal dollars that you're willing to give. So currently that's 90% of the cost. And we want to allow individuals that fall in this coverage gap um, and take our current Medicaid enrollees and these other individuals who have not qualified before. Let's increase the eligibility and let's use the federal dollars to purchase private insurance policies for these individuals. Um, and so so therefore, the, you know, those who were on Medicaid transitioned into the private insurance market, and also those who did not have, have coverage before were afforded access to healthcare coverage, and it was through a private insurance policy, which tends to have better benefits and more coverage than the traditional Medicaid program. I think Dr. Rayford mentioned it earlier in terms of some limitations or restrictions that are in the traditional Medicaid program. So they had access to private health insurance policies, which gave them access to a broader scope of, of services that are covered by that policy. And so some other benefits in the Arkansas model that they saw because they used the private insurance market, it was a more efficient or less costly for the state to buy coverage in that market. They were also able to move um, members who were in the traditional Medicaid program over to the private insurance market. So those individuals, so the state now received 90% uh, of the cost of that coverage versus under the traditional Medicaid program, as you pointed out before, Jarvis, they may only get 75% of that cost covered by federal dollars. So they were gaining from that switch by, you know, 15% just by switching the individuals. So they achieved and, and realize significant savings. And so Arkansas, for example, between 2018 and 2021, forecasted over $400 in savings to the state program um, through that private option that they did. The other benefit in utilizing the private insurance market was it increased the uh, number of people participating in the private insurance market, which decreased the risk. Um, and, and so it, it, it stabilized commercial healthcare insurance premiums across the state. Um, and so when you have more people participating and there's more money flowing into it, and you've got more people participating in the, in the risk pool, it becomes, um, it requires less money to cover the cost of health care. Um, and so there are a number of benefits. And the other, the other reason I point to, to Arkansas is, is you know, we're, our two states are very similar in terms of population, demographics, the rural nature of our states, the types of um, uh, um, industries that we have throughout the state are very similar. And so Arkansas has had one hospital closure in the past decade. And as Jamie pointed out earlier, we've had, what, six hospitals closed in the last decade in the state of Mississippi. So clearly there's a, there's a positive um, benefit to rural healthcare based on that model. And so the actual cost of the expansion for the state of Arkansas has been a net savings to the state not an actual cost to the state. So the state has not had to, um, has not had to come out of pocket, if you will, to pay for that 10% um, of the expansion. So Shane, I know you, um, you and other hospital CEOs have 
been well versed on this issue and been advocates for some type of healthcare coverage expansion. Um, what has been that recept? What has been the reception with state lawmakers when when you talk about these issues? And well, of course, so. Senator McMahon yeah. can jump in and 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 tell us about his experience too. Yeah, and, and my per, my perception of of that is that um, um, when legislative leaders um, spend time looking at this and and look at the various various options that are available and look at both the the business case for expansion as well as the positive impact it could have on residents in Mississippi, um, that uh, some light bulbs go off and they start seeing that this is you know, this is something that we should do. Um, but they all live in the political reality that we live in today. And so not everybody agrees with, quote, Medicaid expansion. Um, and so just the political reality of trying to get more and more people on board uh, with this and to perhaps push aside some, some individual partisan politics uh, and really focus on the need we have. Um, I think I think the the Blue Ribbon Committee that Senator Maman um, mentioned earlier, the more education and exposure we can give to our leaders across the state to this topic and to the impact that other states have experienced, I think we will get more and more leaders on board with this. Senator McMahon, any comments on that? Well, uh, most political leaders are trying to reflect the will of the people they represent. And I don't, I don't know if a majority of Mississippians are at the point where they would like to see some type of health care, access to health care program expanded. Uh, the area that I represent, North Lee and Itawamba County, I, I can tell you it's about 50-50. I poll this issue pretty regularly with civic clubs, and when I do uh, conduct polling, uh, this area is, is open to it. But one of the reasons I think this area is also open to it is because the lar it's an economic issue. The largest employer in this region is North Mississippi Health Services, which has nearly 9,000 employees. So it affects, a lot of, it affects a whole lot of families in this area. Uh, the, the, the healthcare industry. So I, I think most people are just trying to reflect the will of their district. You know, uh, I know it was very, it was a very partisan issue when it passed, uh, when, when the Affordable Air, when the Affordable Care Act passed, it was very controversial because it was really passed by one party and didn't have any bipartisan support. But guys, that was three presidents ago. And so I think it's time for us to sit down. And now that we've had time that 38 other states are doing this in some form, I think it's a good time for us to, to sit down together as a family, Mississippi, like, like we are. I like to say Mississippi's not a state, it's a family. We should sit down as a family and discuss how we can, how we can expand service and, and access to health care uh, insurance service to all Mississippians. Thank you, Senator. Um, I think I have one final question that came in from the chat and then it's dealing with um, just how we talk about this issue, the language we use, how important is the term Medicaid expansion or Medicaid itself, itself and how does that, if, how does that play into the debate, just that term itself and if we got away from calling it Medicaid expansion, um, would this play out any differently? Well, you know, if we were to pass, if we could come up with some legislation together where we could have private health insurance, we, we could end Medicaid. There may be no Medicaid expansion. We might end Medicaid in the entire state. I would love to, I, my goal, I would love to see every Mississippi man, woman, and child have a private insurance policy. That's a win for everybody because then everybody has a, as a healthcare policy, um, everyone, you know, that will lower the cost. It, it will help the hospital systems. It'll help our working families. It'll help the children. That's a win for everybody. So we don't know what it would look like uh, moving forward. 
but until we have these discussions, um, until we have a blue ribbon commission and have these discussions, then I think that we're just going to continue to, to volley this ball back and forth until we come up with a plan to move it forward. Any other comments from panelists on that issue? Yeah, I, I, I just want to kind of reiterate what I mentioned earlier is just bringing more awareness and educating people that don't understand it to the, to the need that there is for it, whether it's through Medicaid expansion or private health insurance or whatever we want to call it. Um, I think just, again, just changing that narrative and really positioning it in a way that people understand what it is and who is eligible or who's not eligible and who could benefit from it. I think that's just a, a natural starting place that um, needs to take place in these conversations. And I did want to mention, um, you may be familiar with the Manat report that was published in November of last year, so just a few months ago, um, as part of the Commonwealth Fund and Robert Wood Johnson helped produce this report that just talks about the fiscal impact of expansion in Mississippi, um, kind of touching on the comments that you made, um, Shane, about just what it would do and how it would benefit us. So if you haven't looked at that report, I would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, and I also want to just kind of give a quick little uh, kind of highlight to our nonprofits in Mississippi. We have about 14,000 registered nonprofits through the Secretary of State. About 200 of those are providing direct service, direct care to individuals across the state. Um, and I pulled up a list of those in Lee County, and there's about 12 that are listed there that are really providing those direct services and direct support to people in your community. Um, and so I think it's important that the nonprofit uh, sector has a, a seat at the table and a voice in these conversations as well. So whenever whoever starts facilitating this or you put this Blue Ribbon Committee together, um, I think it's important that you do in, include and incorporate these nonprofits that are partnering up and providing these services um, to be able to provide input and guidance in decisions and direction as well. Thank you, Jamie. Um, one thing I've noticed from the comments that I've received via text that are going forward on, uh, on the Facebook account is that there's a lot of interest in fostering greater dialogue on this issue, whether it's a commission or uh, whatever it may be. Uh, people wanna know how they can get something done or how they can spark uh, a movement to get something done. So um, hopefully this is something, this conversation um, and this, you know, the activities folks are gonna be doing over the weekend can influence people to be more involved in this issue and um, they can work with lawmakers and professionals like yourself to, to actually get some movement on um, at least a dialogue on this issue. So um, we're running up close to time. So what I did wanna do is give everyone a couple minutes to uh, make some closing remarks and um, um, just share your thoughts on this overall discussion. And feel free to jump in. Thank, thank you again for giving us this forum, this venue to have the conversations. Um, and I appreciate the, the panelists participation. Um, and I appreciate you all giving us the opportunity to talk about a very important topic like this. Um, I didn't chime in, but I should have. I, th I think um, referring to this as Medicaid expansion can be confusing because that would assume that Medicaid, expanding the existing Medicaid is the only the only option to address the increase in health insurance coverage in our state. And so as we talked about earlier, there are multiple models, there are different options of how you can expand health insurance coverage. So I want to make sure that we focus on the real issue and that's health insurance coverage, whether that's expansion of Medicaid or finding other ways to utilize the federal funding that's available to purchase private insurance policies. Uh, the real need to be addressed is the need for health, greater health insurance coverage across the state of Mississippi. Um, and I would challenge those who are listening today and those who are participating. Uh, I mentioned there is a wealth 
of data and information on the experience of other states. And if you spend any amount of time looking at some of that data and information, the, there's overwhelming support um, that illustrates the benefits of expansion of health insurance coverage in all of these states. Um, and if you wanna focus in on some of our neighbors like Arkansas and Louisiana, you can go and find their experience uh, in those studies. And it's been significantly positive in both of those states. Um, I'll also say that there, there are plenty of options available where this would not cost the state um, out of pocket, if you will, out of its, um, out of its general uh, revenue uh, to support a program like this. So I don't think we should um, see cost as the biggest limitation for us expanding health insurance coverage in the state. I would like to share that I appreciate the opportunity to share some and exchange thoughts and ideas today. Thank you for to the King Committee for including me. I'm humbled to do that, uh, to, to have participated. Uh, again, I'm not necessarily for Medicaid expansion, but I am for, for, for providing insurance to every Mississippian. We need to have this conversation, have a Blue Ribbon Commission on this. So we can get, because we could end Medicaid if we come up with a private sector solution, that could happen. Um, but I do want to say in the, in the spirit of uh, this MLK weekend for Dr. Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King was a pastor. He, he, he believed the principles, the teachings of Jesus Christ that said that you should love your neighbor in spite of whatever color they are, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. And uh, Dr. King had a, he had a dream that in this country, that people would be judged on their character and not the color of their skin. And my favorite quote of Dr. Martin Luther King's is that he, he chose to love because hate was too great a burden to bear. And I love that. And I'm asking all Mississippians to see each other, not as a state, but as a family. Let's talk to each other, be kind to each other, and work together for the betterment of our state. No one's gonna get 100% of everything they want, but we can find compromises to move our state forward together in the 21st century. And let's live up to our, let's live up to our reputation as the hospitality state where everybody's welcome. So thank you so much, uh, Mr. Deutsch for this opportunity. Uh, Ms. Brevard, thank you. I appreciate being included in the panel. Thank you all for what you shared today. Um, I, I agree with your sentiments there. And I think, you know, an easy thing to do is just to be better listeners as well. Um, have a little bit more empathy and compassion for people as we are working through uh, really difficult issues that our state is facing right now. And um, even as you're, you know, in Jackson and uh, the decisions that are being made there, you know, the, we can work better together. And that's what we say at the Alliance is we don't want to be siloed anymore. We want to work better together. And I think part of that is just really taking the time to listen. And especially on this issue, we've all shared personal stories today. And there's so many more stories that are out there that if we would just really listen to, to better understand what we need to do to get to a better solution, what we need to do to create a better society for our state and everybody that's in it. Um, so honored to be here and participate in this among the other um, panelists and thankful that we, uh, again, can lift up the voice of our nonprofits and our philanthropy community across the state. And I'd like to close by thanking the Committee for King for inviting me to join this panel and share um, my experiences and the stories of some of the people I've come across. Um, I want to close by saying that as a clinician, as a physician, my lifelong professional aspiration is to take care of people as if their insurance didn't matter. Um, the reality is it does matter now. Um, and my hope is that when I'm looking over a, a career served, that we move to the point that we, we move to that point that we took insurance status away from one of the things that determine how well care is.
Well, thank you to all of the panelists for um, agreeing and coming on board and sharing your thoughts and having a great discussion on this issue. Uh, I hope everyone that's watching or watches this after um, afterwards um, enjoys this discussion and get something out of it. I know I learned a lot. Um, I appreciate the experiences and the points that everyone made here. And again, I thank Sean and Reverend Pinson for inviting me to participate in the entire committee. Um, with that said, I think we're right up on four. So we did a great time on, uh, great job on time, guys. So appreciate you all again. Um, everyone have a great rest of your Sunday afternoon. Thank you. Be safe, stay well, thank you. Great job. Oh, yeah.